Hello guys, welcome back to my channel. We are currently in module 3 on the Pyramids 2019 CXC Cape Pass paper. And of course this is paper 2. And in module 3, the first question here we have is limit. Let's get right into it. Now it says that a function is given as f of x equal the root of minus x when x is less than 0. 1 when x is between x is greater than 0 but less than or equal to 1. And root x when x is greater than 1. This is what is called a piecewise function. Now it says find a limit of f of x as x approaches 0 from the left. Now from the left you know that's going to be less than. So we are looking for the function that tells me that x is less than 0. Which turns out to be the first piece up here. So all I'm going to do here is simply input 0 into this function. So I'm going to have the root of negative zero all right all right now zero can be negative or positive zero is just zero so i'm just going to end up with root zero which is going to give me zero by itself all right zero doesn't have a sign it can't be negative or positive as it's neutral so when you approach zero from the left which means you're looking for where x is less than zero this is a function that would be applied all right let's see it's done some more now It says determine whether the limit of f of x exists as x tends towards 0 and give a reason. Now let's start with the reason. If the limit exists, so if the limit as x tends towards 0 of f of x exists, then of course coming from the left and the right must be the same. So the limit of f of x as x tends to 0 from the left, so you have 0 with a minus sign there, must be equal to the limit of f of x as x tends towards 0 from the right. We already know that this side is 0. All right. Now let's go back up and we're going from the right. From the right would simply mean that x is greater than 0, which in any case, the function where x is greater than 0 is this one here. So here you have x being greater than 0, but less than or equal to 1. So it's going to be equal to 1. All right. So let me go back down. So one side is equal to 0. The other side is equal to 1. 0 is not equal to 1, clearly. Alright? So therefore, the limit does not exist. Does not exist. Alright. Now, these are some marks that everyone should get. Right? A three easy marks is probably the easiest mark you can get. Alright. Now, it says, determine whether or not f is continuous as x is equal to at x equal to 1 given your reason let's start with the reason again if if f is continuous now you cannot write a statement there it means the limit of f of x as x tends towards 1 must be equal to f of 1 good so it must exist at a point f of 1 must exist that's the first thing for it to be continuous and the limit must also be equal to f of 1 which means the limit from the left, the limit from the right. Now let's go back up to the function and examine what happens to the piecewise function at x equal to 1. Now at x equal to 1, come if you're coming from the left, the function is going to be equal to 1. And of course, f of 1 is also equal to 1. Because here it says when x is less than or equal to 1. Alright? So it's going to be equal to 1. From the right now, it's going to be root x. Let's go down here. Let's go back down here. So the limit, of course, coming from the left and the right is two different things. So I'm going to have to split it up. So limit of f of x as x tends towards 1 from the left must be equal to the limit of f of x as x tends towards 1 from the right, which is equal to f of 1. All right, good. All right, coming from the left, we found out that this was really equal to 1, standard value. Also, we found out that f of 1 was also equal to 1. And from the right, it's going to be root 1. Now, 1 is equal to 1, which is equal to 1. All the conditions are met. So, therefore, f of x is continuous at x equal 1. Good. And there we have it. That's three easy marks. You never give away those three easy marks on a piecewise function. Pretty straightforward. All right, part B says determine the point at which a tangent to the curve is parallel to the line 
3x minus y plus 6 equal to 0. All right, if they are parallel, the tangent is parallel, they have the same gradient. So I need to know what the gradient of this line is. To make it easy, I'm simply going to transpose it and put it in the form y equal mx plus c. Now, since the y is negative, let's bring it over. So you have 3x plus 6 is equal to y. Or y is equal to 3x plus 6. So the gradient is equal to 3. All right, we know that. Now, we have the curve y equal x root x. To get the gradient of the tangent, I'm going to have to differentiate this thing. All right? Now, of course, you do understand that I'm going to be using calculus in this case. Well, once we say differentiate, we mean we have to use calculus. Now, this is a product, so I can use a product rule. So u would be equal to x and v would be equal to root x, which we can change to x to the half. Now, du over dx is simply going to be equal to 1. dv, dx, you know the rule. You bring the power to the front, so you have a half. You bring back the variable, and you subtract 1 from the power, so you have negative a half. All right? And if you want, we can tidy up this thing as best as possible. So I could write this as, I could bring this down to make the x, it comes x to the positive half, and I could put it back as a root. So I could say 1 over 2 root x, really. All right? Now, dy dx is equal to, and of course, to make it easy to remember, we're going to go like this. So this way first, v du over dx, so I'm going to have x to the half, plus, we've got this direction now, u dv, so which is going to be, well, we can just say x over 2 root x. All right, good. Now, of course, Knowing what's going to happen here, I might want to tidy this up as best as possible. All right, so let me put um, this over 1. My LCM would be 2 root x. 1 into 2 root x is going to be 2 root x. Now, 2 root x times x to the half. This is really root x as well. Let me just put that in there so you really understand what's going on. This is the same thing as root x or x to the half. Now, when root x multiplies root x, the root is going to cancel out. All right, so I'm going to have 2x. All right, what about over here? This into itself is just going to give me about that. See, it's going to end up with x there. So this is really 3x over 2 root x. And by laws and indices, I can make this simpler. All right? By saying, since the bases are the same, the x's are the same, I can go down some more and look at what I'm going to do. I'm going to have 3x over 2x to the half. By laws and indices, you divide two things with the same base, you subtract the power. So I'm going to have 3 over 2, x to the half. Good. Now we can say perfect. Now go back up to where we want the coordinates, where the gradient of the tangent is the same. So since we have the gradient function, we're simply going to equate it to the gradient that we have over here, which is 3. So we're going to have 3 over 2, x to the half is equal to 3. All right? So we, we can cross multiply 2 times 3 is 6. So 3x to the half is equal to 6. x to the half is equal to 6 over 3. What do I do to get x? All right, so I'm going to have x to the half equal to 2. And so in order to get rid of the square, or the square root, or the half power, we're going to have to square both sides. So x is equal to 4. Now, once you have the x value, we can find the y value by simply going back to this here. So y is simply going to be equal to 4 root 4. All right. Coming down. All right. So y equal to 4 root 4. And 4 root 4 is simply going to be square root of 4 is 2. 4 times 2 is 8. So I'm going to have the coordinate being 4, 8. And what did the question ask me for? It says determine the point at which the tangent is parallel. All right. Once the tangent is parallel, the gradient must be the same. So the point would be 4, 8. And that's the end of that question there. All right. Question C. It says a function is given as y equals sine square cos of cos x. Show that the x coordinate of a stationary value y are this and this. Okay. So what happens at the stationary point? At stationary point... dy dx is going to be equal to 0. So I'm going to have to find a gradient function first of all. 
Now, to make this easier, I'm going to rewrite this function so I don't get confused. So I'm going to say y equal a sine of home bracket cos x. I'm going to put that in a different bracket and I'm going to put the 2 out here. All right. So clearly, this relies on the chain rule. Now, you have to be strategic about this. Let's go. So with the chain rule, the first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to probably write in smaller, is to bring the power to the front. So the power comes down as 2. And the function comes back as the sine of cos x all raised to the 1 power. That's step 1. You bring the power to the front, you bring back the function. Now you're going to have to multiply by the differential of what's in the bracket. Now let's take this step by step. The differential of sine is cos. So I'm going to have cos and I put by the function, which is cos x. All right? And I'm going to have to multiply by the differential of what's in the small bracket. The differential of cos x, which is going to be in negative sine x. So the thing about it is that if you take it step by step, you can't go wrong. Let's go again. You bring the power to the front first. You bring back the function and you subtract 1 from the power. You differentiate what's inside of the bracket. Inside I have sine of something. The differential of sine is cos. It's going to be cos of the thing. And then of course you're going to multiply by the differential of what's in the smaller bracket. The differential of cos x, which is negative sine x. All in all, this can be fixed up nicely. So this can become, let me see, 2 sine, put the negative 2 out there, cos x, cos of cos x times sine x. And let me bring something. You should be seeing something here. So this is where now you have to ensure that all the modules are connecting. All right. So for example, you know the identity, and let me use a different color here. You should be able to see a very nice identity here. Remember now that 2 sine A cos A is equivalent to sine 2A. Now, in this, my question to you, what is my A in this case? My A is cos X. All right, so you have sine cos X cos cos X, and you have a 2. So this is really going to boil down to negative sine, open bracket, 2 cos X. And of course, I put by the sine x that is right there. Is that nicely done? Now, what this is what we call a gradient function, dy dx. Now, at a gradient, when a gradient function is equal to zero, that is where we have a stationary point. So it says state show that the x coordinate of a stationary point, stationary values of y are good. So at a stationary point, the gradient function is equal to zero. So I'm gonna have to equate this function to zero. All right. So this implies that negative sine 2 cos x times sine x equal to 0. You know the concept. Once two things multiply to give you 0, one of them must be 0. So it's either negative sine of 2 cos x equals 0 or sine x equals 0. Now, there are, there are 1 million values you can sign to get 0. So we're going to have to draw out the general solution. And let me remind you of that now. For sine, the general solution is n pi plus negative 1 to the n times alpha. Right? Alpha is going to be sine inverse 0, which turns out to be 0. So this is going to become n pi plus negative 1 to the n times 0, which is just n pi. Alright? So that part is taken care of. Come back on the side. Let's go step by step. You're going to have to, of course, kill the negative. But 0 can't be negative, so you can just drop the negative here. What I would normally do is either multiply both sides by a negative or divide both sides by a negative. But seeing that 0 is on the other side, doesn't matter. So you have sine of 2 cos x equals 0. Take the step by step. All right? Now, what you have inside here is 2 cos x. So I'm going to have to get rid of a sign that is on the outside here. So this implies that 2 cos x is equal to the sine inverse of 0. All right? Which in any case is going to give me sine inverse 0 is 0. So I'm going to have 2 cos x is equal to 0. Right, let me take this down some more so I can get some more space. If 2 cos x is equal to 0, then dividing both sides by 2, I'm going to end up with cos x equal to 0. Now for cos, the general solution is theta equal n 
well, 2n pi plus r minus alpha. Good, so I need to find alpha. Alpha equal to cos inverse of 0. Now, when I cos inverse 0, alpha turns out to be pi over 2. So x is going to be 2n pi plus r minus pi over 2. Now, is that what they wanted? Let's go back up and see if our answer is matching. That is exactly what they wanted. What they did is to write the, the pi first. So you have plus r minus pi over 2 plus 2n pi, right? And you write a statement there. So therefore, therefore, as a final statement, x is equal to n pi r plus r minus. They write this first, pi over 2 plus, oh my, I left out the n plus 2n pi. All right, there goes your two solutions. Okay. Determine the nature of the stationary value at x equal n pi. All right, now to determine the nature, I'm gonna need a second derivative, all right? So I need d squared y over dx squared. So I'm gonna have to go back for dy dx. Now, dy dx, according to what we have, let me go back up so we don't miss it. We found dy dx to be um, negative sine 2 cos x times sine x. So let me go right here, put it back right here. Negative sine 2 cos x times sine x. All right, so I'm going to have to apply a product rule here along with the chain rule. So all this would be u. And this is v. Remember, you can't split the sine away from the 2 cos x because this is sine off. So it's like a complete function by itself. All right, let's go down and try to maneuver this now. So let me separate them. I'm going to say that u equal negative sine 2 cos of x and v is equal to sine x. Now let's start with the easier one, v prime. V prime is just going to be cos x, right? Build up your confidence over there. And U prime now, once again, chain rule concept. So you're going to differentiate negative sine, which is going to give you a negative cos. And you put back the 2 cos x multiplied by now the differential of what is inside of this bracket here. Now when I differentiate 2 cos x, I'm going to get negative 2 sine x. All right, good. Let's make this simpler. This negative right, that is right here can come to the front. So I have negative 2 cos of 2 cos x times sine x. All right. Let's tidy up this thing now. We're almost there. So I'm going to say that d squared y over d x squared is going to be equal to, all right, remember the direction as we go. We go this direction first. So you have negative 2 cos x, 2 cos x times sine x times sine x is sine squared x, right? Sine squared x. Plus, we go this direction next, where you're going to have the sine of 2 cos x times the cos of x. All right. Now, we need to test... Test x equal n pi. Now, what I would say to you guys is that you need to have a general idea of what a graph looks like when doing something like this, right? A general idea. Because this can help you very much. Pi over 2. Um, pi. 3 pi over 2. And of course, 2 pi. And the same thing happens over here. Pi over 2, bam, bam, bam. So this, I'm going to go with sine x graph first. All right, so remember the sine x graph now. It starts down here, comes up to 1, go back down, come back up. And if you were to continue this, you'd realize what would happen. Right. Now the graph of cos x. So I have pi over 2, pi, 3 pi over 2, 2 pi, minus pi over 2, pi, 
minus 3 pi over 2 and minus 2 pi. Alright, so we start it up here, we come down, we go back up, come up over here, come down here, we go back up, and of course, we go up here, and then of course, if you were to extend this graph, alright, so 2 plus, alright, so we're going up by pi over 2, right? So 2 plus a half is 2 and a half, which is 5 over, well, 5 pi over 2. And then of course you're gonna have 3 pi. So it comes it's gonna come down here and go like that. Good. So let's see what happens. Alright, so we have a two graphs. I'm gonna need some more space now. Let me test n pi. But the difference now, here's a problem now. Clearly I can see that from alright, let me also put an x piece of the sine x graph so we understand this very good so you're gonna have 5 pi over 2 and you're gonna have 3 pi alright so it goes up come back down right here alright so now let's go down we're gonna take the n pi now and put it into the function but there's something unique about n pi look at the cost graph on the cost graph with n pi you realize that when n is um, odd, see I have a maximum down there, it's down at it's minimum rather, it's down at negative one. But when n is even, you can see the difference, right? So even if you continue, you keep on seeing that. And remember, whatever happens on the left also happens on the right. So we're gonna have to separate it out into odd and even. When n is odd, when n is even. For the sine graph, at every pi, at every n pi, you're gonna get zero. So sine x at n pi is strictly zero, as you can see, right there, right there, right there. It doesn't matter whether other are even. So let's go down now. I wonder if I'm gonna have enough speed. All right, let me let me see if I can do it over here. When n is odd. All right, so you're gonna have negative two. All right, there shouldn't be an x here. I think I have a little error right here. So it's negative 2 cos of. Let me go up to ensure that that error isn't repeated. Go up a bit. Yeah. So the error is here. I shouldn't have had a cos x. The x shouldn't be there because the function is 2 cos x, right? So it's cos of that. Whoa. Let me just remove this here. Right, so let's take this out. So this needs to come out. So it's cos of this, right? Cos of this. All right, good. Let's go back down. So you have to be very careful when dealing with this thing. All right, so I'm down here now. So when n is odd, I'm going to put it inside of this. Clearly, this part is going to be zero, right? Because of the sine. Based on the sine graph, once you sign anything with a pi, with a 1 pi, as you can see, 2 pi or 3 pi, that's zero. And once you multiply by zero, the entire thing is zero. So all that part is zero. Over on this side, no. This is the interesting part. Now, let's look at the cost graph to see what happens when n is odd. Let's take this down a bit. Now, when n is odd, you notice that's where you're getting the negative values. So you have pi, 3 pi, so you're, you're going to keep getting a negative one. So right here, I'm going to have sine of 2 times negative 1, because that's going to give me a negative 1, times negative 1. Now, when I sign something negative, I'm going to end up with a negative value. So this is going to be a negative times a positive. 
or get so better yet let me tidy this up okay you need to know these rules are trick if i sign something negative is the same thing as saying negative sign of two all right you can bring the negative out there times negative one which is going to give me a positive sign two that is what is going to harm all right now what about when n is even all right now when n is even this is what is going to happen when n is even this is still going to be zero all right so that's dead over on this side when it's even clearly you can see that it's going to be on top so it's going to be positive so i'm going to have the sign of This is just going to be 2 and then times when it's even, it's also positive. So the cost of it is also going to be positive 1. So I'm just going to put sine 2. Now, since this thing is actually greater than 0, in both cases, in both cases it's greater than 0, we can outrightly state, we can say since d squared y over dx squared, is greater than zero x equal n pi produces a minimum turning point minimum minima all right and that that's a wrap